Okay, so do you have any questions? If you remember on Monday, we had started the study of the waveguides, which we basically use to guide uh, electromagnetic waves from point to point. And there were several things that we had seen. We had seen that if we have, for example, a waveguide with a rectangular cross section <coughs> with side lengths A and B, we, found, we, we figured out that, the, well, first of all, we found out that uh, in general we can write all the components of the waveguide in both TE mode and TM mode in terms of EZ or BZ, the, Z, the component of the electric field in the Z direction. So this is the Z direction we have. And in this mode, in the TE mode, EZ turned out to be some coefficient A times cosine n pi over a x times uh, cosine m pi over a a, a y n and m being constants both of them cannot be zero <laughs> so this was in an empty waveguide and we, what we also found out was <coughs> the uh, the k and the omega values were related to each other. k was just square root of omega squared minus omega m n, <coughs> 1 over c, where this omega m n was given by omega m n squared was n pi over a squared plus m pi, this is b, let's say this is x, this is now this is y, this is x. So this is b, this is a. m pi over a squared. This was the omega squared. And the last thing we had said was, <coughs> well, you see, k over omega, which we identified as the phase velocity of this wave, this was equal to Now this was one over the wave velocity, or let me write it in this form, omega over k, which was the phase velocity. This was c over square root of one minus omega m n squared divided by omega squared, which was larger than c. So basically this wave, the phase velocity of this wave moves faster than the speed of light. Now when we look at the group velocity, you see group velocity is the derivative of omega with respect to k, or one over the derivative of k with respect to omega. This is equal to one over derivative of, the k is just written over there. The derivative with respect to omega is just uh, one over c times omega over square root of omega squared minus omega m and squared and this is equal to c square root of 1 minus omega m n squared divided by omega squared. And hence the, now this is the group velocity. The group velocity is less than c. Now what is the group velocity? It is basically the velocity with which if you create a package of finite length made up of these waves, it is the speed that that package moves. So basically, if you are transferring energy, you are transferring energy in this package, and this energy, uh, this package moves with a speed less than the speed of light. So there's actually no problem here, although the phase velocity turns out to be faster than C, it's not really something we can use to transfer any energy or any impact. Now, any questions about the waveguides and the speed of waveguides? We will see in a moment why we have this larger than, what is the speed that is moving larger than the speed of light. Uh, by the way, this is EZ0, not EZ. Any questions?
Yani aslında hocam parçacık dediğiniz şey ışıklarınızla hareket etmiyor. You see, what Einstein theory tells us that no causal effect can move faster than the speed of light. That is, if I do something over here, whatever I do here, whatever means I use, my influence on you will, take, will be after at least a time our distance divided by the sea. I cannot influence you earlier than that time. We can uh, we can define quantities which has the dimension of velocities. There is no problem with that. I mean, it's just our imagination. Our imagination. Just take, I don't know, just rotate around yourself and relative to your reference frame, the stars are moving much, much faster than the speed of light. But that is not something that can influence us. That is not something we can use to transfer energy or transfer information faster than the speed of light. Or similarly, if you just move, take your laser pointer, just move it around slowly, well, the image of that laser pointer will move much faster than the motion of your hand. But that doesn't mean that you can transfer information from this point to our image, or between two points where my, the image of my, the, laser, the laser pointer was, I cannot just transfer information between those points faster than the speed of light. Whatever I, ch I do, if I change the laser, it will move to that point with the speed of light. So the, the thing is, well, there is this speed, but what it is? What is it? So let's try to understand that speed. What is that speed? Is it a physical speed? Well, definitely the, it's not the group velocity, or definitely it's not the velocity with which the energy flows. There was one problem in the recitation, how you were supposed to study, which for, uh, asks you to calculate the, full, the speed at which the energy flows. And if you solve that problem, you will see that it moves slower than the speed of light. It doesn't move with phase velocity. Now, let's see what these speeds are. This is my E at zero. So EZ is EZ0 times e to power i kz minus omega t. This is equal to A over 4 e to the power i and pi over b x plus e to the power minus i and pi over b y multiplied with e to the power i m pi over a now this, these are both x, m pi over a y plus e to the power minus i m pi over a y times e to the power i k z minus omega t. Well, I can just open up this parenthesis. There are many terms over there. Let me just pick up one of them. This is a over 4 e to the power i n pi over b x plus n pi over a y plus k z minus omega t. Plus I have other terms. Well, let me write one more term. I have two more terms that look almost like these ones. Their difference is that this factor over here n has a minus sign in front. That's the only difference. So I have, if, I, if you just multiply out the product, you will get four terms. Now let's see what these are. You see here, I just have a monochromatic wave with the wave vector, let me call it k1, given by n pi over a in the x direction plus m pi over b, now m pi over b, m pi over a in the y direction, 
plus k in the z direction. This is my wave vector. Now, if you write the magnitude of this wave vector, you see the 1 over the velocity of this wave, the speed of this wave, is nothing but the magnitude of k1 divided by omega. And if you just write it down, that is square root of n pi over b squared plus n pi over a squared plus k squared divided by omega. But you see, k squared, this is nothing but omega m n squared plus k squared over omega. You see here, yes. But remember, k squared is just 1 over c squared omega squared plus omega minus omega m n squared. This is what the values of k squared are. Uh, I, okay, so I think I have forgotten some factors. That is not omega squared, that is c squared omega, uh, omega squared over c squared. This factor over here is omega squared over c squared. So this is nothing but c, 1 over c. So you see, if I write it, my wave in the waveguide as a superposition of these monochromatic waves, each one of these monochromatic waves are moving with the speed c. You see, this wave, the first one, let me just sketch the cross section. Let's say this is the z axis, and this is the y axis. Now this wave, this plane wave is basically moving in this direction. This is the direction in which my wave is moving, and it has a speed c. Now if you look at the other wave, other wave has the same x component, the wave vector has the same x component, same z component, just the opposite y component. It just hit the boundary in the y direction and bounced back. So that is the other wave. This is my k1, this is k2. They have the same magnitudes. So basically, the, my wave is bouncing in between these two surfaces of my waveguide. So that is why I have these two components. And as it's bouncing up and down, it is moving with the speed c. Not with a different speed. So since my plane wave is moving with the speed c, but this speed c is not horizontal along, the, uh, along my waveguide, the energy that this plane wave carries along this waveguide is smaller than c. It's just a component of the velocity in the, along the z direction. So the phase velocity is just, or the group velocity, or the velocity with which speed, with which energy is carried along my waveguide is just c times cosine theta. theta being that angle over there. And cosine of that angle is nothing but k1y divided by, no, sorry, square root of k1x squared plus k1y squared divided by square root of k1x squared plus k1y squared plus k squared. So basically this K1, I, uh, it has a horizontal component and a vertical component. And the horizontal component is, sorry, is K, K is just K1Z.
the horizontal component is K1z, the vertical com the magnitude is this one, so this is the cosine of the angle. Let, let me call this horizontal velocity. And it is definitely less than C. Now let's look at something else, some other velocity. You see, this is my K. The wave fronts are these. So there is this point, the point A. As my wave is moving in this direction, this point A is also moving along the z-axis. The speed of A is just C over cosine theta, which is definitely larger than C. But you see, the speed of A, okay, we define some speed, but it's not really something we can use to transfer energy. So it doesn't really, we don't really care whether this speed is larger than C or not. It's not important for us. It doesn't violate Einstein's theory of relativity. Well, you can calculate the energy tensor, energy flow, and calculate the, obtain the speed with which the energy is carried through the wire. That's the recitation problem. Of course, you can, I mean, is it related? Sure, it's related somehow, but which, how? It, it's open to interpretation. You have to interpret those results. Uh, hold on, why? Okay, you see, I didn't say that, okay, having a speed and gaining a speed are different things. You are talking about Newton's laws, right? So the force is equal to mass times the acceleration. But how do you apply it to electromagnetic waves? They are not particles. Newton's laws are applied to point particles. Now, electromagnetic waves, they are not accelerating from zero to C. They are at C all the time. Well, let's see why it is one over cosine theta. Let me draw it larger over here. This is, they are moving with speed C in this direction, okay? This is my wave from. Let's say we wait a time delta T. After a time delta T, the same wave from reaches here. So this distance over here, delta X, Delta X is nothing but C times delta T. The point A moves a distance delta Z. Now this angle over here is theta. This angle over here is pi over two minus theta. Similarly, this angle over here is pi over two minus theta. Now this distance is delta x. So delta x over delta z is sine of pi over two minus theta or cosine theta or delta z is equal to delta x over cosine theta. Delta z is equal to c delta t over cosine theta. 
So delta z over delta t is c over cosine theta. But the speed of the point A is nothing but delta z over delta t. So it's faster than the speed of light. But as I said, I don't really care whether it is faster than the speed of light. It doesn't, we don't really mind it. So, you see that uh, length contraction happens when you are comp comparing observations of two observers in two different reference frames. Here, I'm sticking with a single reference frame. In that reference frame, the wavefront is moving with speed c in that direction. In the exactly the same reference frame, the wavefront covers a distance delta x, which is c times delta t. In exactly the same reference frame, delta z is delta x over cosine theta. In the same reference frame, delta z over delta t is c over cosine theta. I'm just sticking with a single reference frame. I'm not comparing measurements between two different reference frames. Of course, in a different reference, in a different reference frame, this delta t will be different, delta x will be different, angle theta will be different. But nevertheless, in that new reference frame, my re final result will not change. But also keep in mind, when, whenever you are talking about wave guides, here we are taking a definite reference frame to start with. We are assuming that the waveguide is at rest. We didn't, we didn't take into account that the motion of the waveguide. Or the same is true when the medium is moving, when we are talking about mediums. We are always working in the reference frame in which the medium is at rest. So whatever we are saying is valid in those particular reference frames. In a different reference frame, things might be different. Uh, we will discuss what relativity says, tells us about electromagnetic fields. We will see. We will study relativity related with Maxwell's equations. Any questions on these rectangular waveguides? You see, the problem is how do you define the velocity of an object that is not point-like? What are your conventions? For a point-like object, the velocity is a well-defined quantity. There is just a single velocity you can really talk about. But if the object is extended, furthermore, if the object is changing its shape all the time, how do you define the velocity? I mean, there are many things that you can have the dimensions of velocity, and one of them has this phase velocity has the dimensions of velocity. That's why we are calling it speed phase. Same, the group velocity has the dimensions of velocity, so that's also why we are calling it the speed. The, I mean, there are, I mean, in some references you can define like eight different kinds of speeds for waves. And I'm sure you can even define more if you want. So you should just stick with what each kind of velocity mean. And when you are saying that, okay, no, nothing can move faster than the speed of light, well, that is one, ref one way of stating Einstein theory of, uh, one of the consequences of Einstein theory of relativity, but it can be kind of misleading. You see, there are these mathematical points like our point A that can move faster than the speed of light. 
but so what? So a better way of saying Einstein theory is you cannot influence anything at a speed faster than the speed of light. Information cannot travel faster than the speed of light. You see, for example, <coughs> I can say that we might, uh, with, as, I don't know, Bilgin, we might agree that we will move in this direction. We can synchronize our clocks. We say that we will move in that direction with uh, such and such a speed for five seconds, and after that, we will just stop. Okay, so we might make such an agreement. But you might not know it. So what you will see is that when we are moving, the moment I stop, he stops. That doesn't mean I'm causing that, though. That doesn't mean information has traveled from me to him faster than the speed of light. Similarly, over here, if you want to create these plane waves, and you see, we are talking about plane waves. One problem with plane waves is that to create them, you have to wait infinitely long time. And once you create them at every point, what the plane wave will do is already fixed. Not because the other point, there is some end, something moving at the other point uh, that influences this one, but that is how we define it. We just synchronize, in a sense, every point in space. So when this point changes, this point also changes. That doesn't mean it's, they are causing each other. Simil just like this point A, when we are talking about these wave fronts infinitely long, they, are, they should be moving in harmony. That's how we define them. It's not because one point is influencing the other one. So if, if they are moving, you see, if you are moving, if you just agree, everybody agrees that they should move in this direction with a given velocity, the point at with which this line intersects this board will be moving much, much faster than us. But so what? We are not able to influence anything else. So a better way in that sense to express the limit of speed is that you cannot influence anything who is separated from you by a distance r earlier than r over c. You see, what will happen here is, suppose you decide to send a signal along this way, along this waveguide. You want to send a signal. So what you do is you create a plane wave, first of all. You send one wave. This is your wave that doesn't carry a signal. It will be bouncing up and down, so it will create this propagating wave. And then you decide to send a different frequency, and that difference will be your message, let's say. That is the information that you will be sending. Well, that change in frequency, that information, that frequency had changed will not move faster than the speed of light. It will move slower. Now, let's look at some other, one more problem this hour. Now, we said that, you see, we had defined TE waves in which the electric field is perpendicular to the Z direction. We defined the TM waves in which the magnetic field is perpendicular to the Z direction. Well, we didn't study them, but their study is identical to the case of TE waves. And we said that TEM waves are waves in which both the electric field and magnetic field, they are perpendicular to the direction of propagation. And we also said that you cannot create TEM waves in an uh, empty waveguide. But nevertheless, you can create TEM waves if you have, let's say, a coaxial waveguide. You see, the, the thing over here is we have two distinct boundaries. Now, the, the problem in creating TEM waves when we had a rectangular waveguide was that the rectangular waveguide has a single boundary, and since E parallel has to be zero on the boundary, this circumference has to be an equal potential surface. So in a TEM wave, it turns out that we can write it as a kind of a potential 
and that satisfies the Laplace's equation in two dimensions. And since at the boundary the potential has to be constant, the potential has to be constant everywhere because the Laplace equation cannot have a local maximum or minimum. That was our problem. But you see here, since we have two different boundaries, if we define a potential, it, will, it has to be constant on this surface, it has to be constant on the inner surface, but it doesn't have to be the same constant both in the inner surface and on the outer surface. So basically we can still define a potential which has different values here and there, so its value in the space in between need not be constant. And hence we can obtain the TEM waves. Well, the solution will be easy to obtain. Let's see, let's just look back to our Maxwell's equations. We have the del dot B is equal to zero. But this just tells me that Uh, derivative of bx, b0x with respect to x plus the derivative of b0y with respect to y, this is equal to zero. I also have, of course, the derivative of bz with respect to z, but bz is zero in the TEM way. So my Maxwell equation in the TEM mode, and again, I'm writing b as b0 e to the power i kz minus omega t. And similarly for E will be E0 e to the power i kz minus omega t. These two things I need to determine. The divergence of B is equal to zero just becomes this equation. There is no z derivative over there. The divergence of E is also zero inside my waveguide. There are no charges inside my waveguide. So the E 0x by dx plus the E zero y by dy equal to zero. Now the curl of B was equal to inside my waveguide mu zero epsilon zero d E by dt. If you just look at the z component only of this equation, well the z component of the electric field is zero in a TEM mode, so the curl of B is zero. DB, db0x by dy minus db0y by del x, this should be equal to zero. And the curl of E is equal to the minus del b by del t. Again, if you just look at the z component of this equation, bz is zero in a TEM mode. So the curl of E, the z component should be zero. And that tells me that de0x by del y minus del E zero Y by del X, this is equal to zero. Let's see. In fact, we, um, if you remember on Monday's lecture, if we want to have both EZ and BZ equal to zero, then we have to have omega over c squared minus k squared should be equal to zero, or omega over k should be equal to c. So the TEM mode moves along the ax, uh, the, this uh, waveguide with the speed c. All of them move with the speed c. So it doesn't disperse the group velocity is equal to the phase velocity is equal to any other kind of velocity they move with speed C. Now you see, just look at the, these three equations. They are exactly the equations that you would get if you don't have the electric field, the electric field doesn't have a Z component. In, if, the electric, if you know that the electric field doesn't have a Z component, And there are no time dependence here. So these are just the equations you get in electrostatics and magnetostatics. Nothing different. They are the same equations. 
all the time derivatives, they disappear because the equations we wrote over here at least, we are looking only at the z components and the z component is zero, so their time derivative just disappears. So we can just borrow our solutions in electrostatics and magnetostatics. They will be exactly the same. So let me just write down the solution. So the electric field we would obtain, well, these formulas you have in your book. So you can just borrow them from your book. If the electric field, in the case of a cylindrical charge distribution, you have some potential inside, some other potential outside, is well, nothing but inversely proportional to S, if you remember your, our electrostatic discussions. We are looking for a wave that propagates. So let's see, the real part will be just cosine Kz minus omega t. Well, basically, this is what we started out with, and it is in the radial direction with certain coefficients. The B field, well, the B field is almost always given by K cross E. So this will be A cosine Kz minus omega T. Well, if you just imagine some currents running on the surface of your cylinder and inside the cylinder, the magnetic field we know that is cir it's circling around the inner cylinder and it will be in the phi hat direction and it is related with the electric field and the relation is just the E should be just B times C, the speed of the wave. Now if you, you can check explicitly, just this satisfies your Maxwell's equations, all of them. And this basically tells us, gives us a TEM mode. You see, this, this solution doesn't exist if we don't have any inner ring. Because if we didn't have this inner cylinder, in that case, it was possible to set S is equal to zero. So these solutions do not make sense in that limit. These are solutions of the E and the B field in the region between your uh, cylinders. So that region doesn't contain the S is equal to zero point. So within our empty space, inside our cylinder, in this region, S is never zero, so this solution would make sense in our region. But if this was not there, we wouldn't get such solutions. Now both are, both in inner cylinder and the outer cylinder, they are conductors, perfect conductors, in fact. Well, per, you see, if it is not a, per, uh, where do we use the fact that our waveguide is made up of a perfect conductor? Well, it's completely bouncing and there is no electric or magnetic fields inside our perfect conductor. So if it's not a perfect conductor, in that case we would get electric fields inside our conductor also, electric and magnetic fields. So if you are looking for the solutions of such a system, well you have region one, region two, region three. You have to write down your solution in region, general solution in region one, your general solution in region two, and your general solution in region three, and you have to match them at these boundaries. Can you obtain a solution? Well, yes, there's no problem with that, but it will be very long. And by assuming that the, uh, uh, the conductor is a perfect conductor, we are basically saying that we know the solution in region one and we know the solution in region three. They are both zero. So it simplifies our life. Not because we cannot find the solution, just but basically because we are making this assumption to simplify our treatment. So what you will end up in the case of non, a non-perfect conductor is that you will have some electric field and magnetic field in region one and electric and magnetic field in region two, region three, there will be some skin depth. 
and beyond that skin depth it will be negligible. So if these are large enough, larger than the skin depth, so you can just assume that it's almost a perfect conductor if the skin depth is very thin. It's just some more complication in your solution. It won't really give us an, any new information. I don't care. You see, we are not studying the problem of we have this waveguide and we send some electromagnetic wave in this waveguide. So in this case, some of the wave will be reflected, some of them will be transmitted inside. So that's a different problem. But we are not studying that problem. For example, in the recitation problems, there was one such ex exercise. But whatever enters the electromagnetic wave, we know that it, it should have the same frequency as the incident wave. If you don't send a linearly polarized wave, well, it's not important because you can write it as a sum of linearly polarized waves. And if you, can, if you know how a single linearly polarized wave behaves, the sum just is, just let's say you have a singular linearly polarized wave, you know this, uh, how much of it will, be, will enter my waveguide, if you have a sum, you just sum the contribution of each wave. So the reason why we are studying linearly polarized or circularly polarized waves is that any wave we can write in terms of them. So if you, if you know how they behave, then we, can, we know how the sum behaves. Is it a, are they are the cylinders separated by perfect conductors or not? Okay, so if you are talking about concentric cylinders, they should be separated somehow, right? So how are they separated? By perfect conductors, non-perfect conductors? But if they are perfect conductors, they are completely independent of each other. And furthermore, what do you mean by efficiency? Energy. We are not losing energy in a single cylindrical waveguide also. So there's no energy loss here. If they are not perfect conductors, if you just put more and more non-perfect conductors over there, well, you are increasing friction. So you are increasing dissipation. Any questions? So this will be basically the end of our discussion on the waveguides. Okay, so let's give a 10 minute break and then we will start a new topic after the break. <laughs>